Prefus inverted preface. The ideas that summed that inspired Prometheus Inverted can be best summed up in a list. Abuse, drugs and addiction, pharmaceutical industry, self-destructive tendencies, the hubris of mankind, absurdity, artificial life and the alienation of technological progress. It is my attempt to take well-established tropes from science fiction literature such as Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and add some romanticism alongside the Crippingly low in the atmosphere and imagine futuristic cosmic expansionism. In a sense, I'm grappling with the question of AI and synthetic life in this quest story. If humanity ever gets to the point of creating host humans, I think it's important that we greet them with open arms instead of our worst aspects. And the novelette, which is just a long short story essentially, explores that question. It is a book that questions and probes, not one that gives easy answers. I'd originally intended this to be a novel, but I think the story demanded a shorter length and a snappier pace. This story also felt much more personal as they set much of it in Manchester, which is my favourite city in the world and where I live and work, so it is also a love hymn to God's own city. Chapter 1 High above the world in the year 2060 AD, Dexter Connor was sitting alone in a cafe in the upper decks of the good ship Nostradamus with a migraine burning in his brain again. Wish this pain would stop, he thought, as the headache made even moving difficult, and he sips on a small glass of water, gazing out the window into the emptiness outside, pondering, well, nothing in particular, while looking deep into the abyss that lay outside, the abyss of deep space. How did he end up here? How did we? Hey, Dexter. A familiar voice rang out from a nearby table, breaking his space dreaming, as his friend Scott McBath entered the cramped cafe cabin quarters and waved to him from across the deck. He was an unnaturally tall Scottish man who carried himself nevertheless with a sublime innocence and friendliness. He was kind to Dexter, who many of the other crew considered an oddball, and some even stooped as low as to call Debra. And Dexter appreciated that. So how is meditations on death go, Dexter? Scott inquired as he sat down in his chair across from him with a slightly worried look on his face, a deep set brow of concern painted on his eyes upon his large forehead. Oh, you know, it is what it is, isn't it? Life, death, the middle bit's okay though, I guess. Dexter replied with a dry tone and a shrug as his deep brown eyes gazed into the distance as the asteroid field they were slowly approaching. We all came from the birth of a star and we all returned to the soil of the earth. That's how you put it before, wasn't it? Yes, Scott. That's how it is. There is no eternity. Death comes for us all. The true equaliser. Hard as it may be to see the other leaves as they fall from the tree. Is everything okay, Dex? You seem a bit down at the minute. Are you depressed? Oh, I'm fine. I chose this life after all, mate. In fact, I have to be back on shift in 20 minutes. And I have to make some extra credits this month. Slightly down on my hours. Had a bit of time off, you know. Got to keep up with the debt repayments and the ever-increasing stack of health bills back home. You need some time off to write, I guess. Scott looked at Dexter with eyes of brotherly care as he thought about who he would, could talk to to make it happen. You got it, Dexter responded with a sad look of melancholia. Absolute mad lad, Scott laughed to himself. You got it, Dexter smiled and got up to leave the cloistered cafe as neon lights blazed and digital sirens wailed in the darkness of another artificial lit day abroad the mining ship Nostradamus en route to mine lithium from the asteroid bait between Jupiter and Mars. Another day in this ruined paradise, another memento to the infinite crushed. Dex daydream lines to himself as he approached his work pod. Connor, watch where you're going you bloody fool shouted a morbidly overweight man in his late fifties with a droopy moustache who was observing Dexter from afar as he descended down his pod bay to begin his shift. Fucking project managers, thought Dexter to himself. Mediocre pencil pushers, bureaucrats of mediocrity, middle managers, pushers, pen, pushing pen, pushing pen. He began to have a short daydream about punching his manager in the face repeatedly. You're on my clock now, you lazy bastard. Get to it, shouted Balor, 
his boss for some reason. Get off my ass, Dr. Robotnik, thought Dexter as he sat in his pod of Morgana's grim work. He entered the chrome metal pod down a ladder, dimly lit with a low red glowing light that often gave him a bit of a headache, and just so occasionally a migraine. He wandered back to why he'd come here, all the reasons he had to leave the safety of Earth and God's own city. He pontificated and decided it was because we as human beings had an inbuilt desire to explore, a will for the new, a longing to move beyond that which is known. But that wasn't the only reason, this is more than that, this is for love, for the promise of family, to bring her back to the fullness of life, to make the middle bit okay again. Space, the new frontier, join the Nostradamus, and together we can build a better world. He remembered the advert well as his migraine began to play the key of its deeper agony. He was a daydreamer, that much was true, yet nightmares also breached the surface of his skin later on along with memories of terror. Man stood in the world below, he still missed occasionally. Why else would he be writing such a lofty piece of philosophy if not as a coping mechanism? Memories of failure, memories of success, memories of Prometheus Labs, thinking of Melanie. Dexter slipped into a daydream again. As the lights flickered in his cramped cubicle, <coughs> Dexter kept an eye out on his monitor for any signs of debris which could compromise the whole of Nostradamus. <coughs> this was a boring and monotonous job, but it did pay well, so there was really no choice. Sometimes in life you just have to do something like work for bigger reasons other than your own ego. This was for her. This was for love. She was struggling when I left Terra so terribly. The blackouts were getting worse. Flashes in the eye again as the migraine intensified. Hey arsehole, you see anything out there? Lay off me mate, I've just started my shift. Yeah okay, well let me see if you see something coming our way, you bloody debber. Debber was the nickname middle management gave to the engineering team in Nostradamus. It meant nothing complimentary and fostered a lot of resentment between the two. That goddamn arsehole gets paid to sit on his arse and look at a clock in his crusty desk while I'm here with my goddamn feet in it. He looked down at his body which felt half suspended in space as he sat in a lotus position staring out of the egg-like container after sitting for 12 hours in deep space to watch, observe and fire at any debris which would breach, could breach Nostradamus' hole. Quite literally. You're having a moment again. Ah, yeah, good day to you Augustus. Dexter greeted his AI companion as his friendly round face popped up on the monitor in front of him and smiled. Still, would I have it any other way? I was surely born for this. And the pay? Well, pay is decent, and with the board on top as well, some busybody pen pushers are the least of my worries. They'll sign their own death warrants eventually. Middle management always does. Knives out. Chapter 2 Five years previously, and it was a cool mid-morning in God's own city, Manchester, England. Dexter Connor gazed out of his laboratory, daydreaming, clothed in a long white overcoat, his glasses gazing into nothing in particular but the clouds, formations in the sky, upon which any shape could be found or seen. A vixen, a fox, a gazelle, a turner landscape, a devil, a wizard, a mare, Dexter. The voice was curt and loud and cut into his mind like thunder from above. Ah, Melanie, isn't it? How are you? Dexter responded a little sheepishly. I'm alright, Dexter, but the routine diagnostics test around this morning held some interesting results. Nothing too unusual, but something a little unexpected, so I thought I'd come and pass them by you and get your opinion on them. Ah, I see, well, what would that be? Some of the subjects seem to be showing signs of waking consciousness. What? Dexter splurged out suddenly as his daydream was splintered in two. That can't be right. Where are the readouts? Well, I almost hope it's impossible. Well, who knows? A weird gig this, isn't it? We were told to expect the unexpected, and well, here we are. Very matter of fact, Dexter liked that about Melanie. Straight to the point. Melanie was an aspiring scientist in the mind just like him, and a specialist in the new emerging engineering and neurologism that was starting to sweep across the world. A whole body of engineering based on the discoveries of the neurologists of the mid-21st century about the brain's function and behaviour, the preservation of minds and brains. 
I don't want to imagine the ethical ramifications if this turns out to be true, sighed Dexter. It would be like being a tra rat trapped in a box, in a box you didn't even know existed. A cage, well, I imagine. Melanie looked out the window now with a gaze that sang of concern as her brow grew heavy and her eyes sunk to the floor. We have to raise this to the head of the project, Melanie. Immediately, I think. Dexter had a look of anxious alarm on his face, conscious of the deep ethical dilemmas Me Melanie's discovery could mean if true. Melanie nodded and walked out of Lab 20, though they had not known each other that long. They did seem to intuitively understand each other without the need for words. Dexter went to his desk and booted up his augmented reality interface, put on his headphones and listened to the melancholic home of Aphex Twins St. Mount St. Michael Mount or St. Michael's Mount. He let it envelop his soul in the warmth of the loving machine as its percussion squelched and recombined patterns in his mind as he sat down at his computer to analyse the data for himself. He trusted Melanie's judgement of course, but science requires objectivity, so he would have to double check the data to be sure of our hypothesis. Mel Melanie retired to her pod as well on the other side of the lab, switching on a machine Delta 52 which booted up with a routine whir as a robotic male voice greeted her with a good morning in a mank accent. Hello love, how can I help you today? It's very much friendly and warm, common amongst the men of Manchester. Hey up well, very faithful, Melanie chuckled to herself. No time for joking though, Melanie suddenly thought, as the screens booted off from black to glowing right in front of her and she logged into her computer. A gooey glowing green against the black she opened up in her chat client and shared the data from the morning onto Dexter, whose face she could now see through her video streaming from his own pod. Looks nervous as usual, the way he bites his lip constantly, and ooh, that nervous twitch he does where he really gets something stuck on something. <laughs> Concentrate, Melanie, you're in the, here in the pursuit of science, not love. Hey, Melanie, can I just call you Mel now? Melanie feels very formal. Dexter looked at her with his squinty eyes through his thick glasses as he struggled to focus on her face on the video monitors of many hours of straining his eyes in front of the screen in the morning. Yeah, of course, Dex, responded Melanie. So let's boot that visualisation graph up we de helped develop during our first month here, I suppose. Melanie shared the graph so they could both look at the EEG readouts of the brains this morning. Hey, Melanie, do you ever wonder how much these rich arseholes paid to get the brains preserved here? I dread to think what the sort of money we'll ever be making any time soon, Melanie chuckled. She was probably right. Chapter 3 Melanie and Dexter walked into the research coordinator's office to deliver their findings. A shimmering smoke punch went in the atmosphere as he looked at a large display flickering with green and yellow graphs, displaying readout data on their brains they were analysing in real time. Graphical representations of once living human beings' organic matter, now preserved to an unspecified date in the future, all the billionaire class. Some people say what we're doing is playing God. The tall, thin man looked at them with a disquieting, intense stare through his thickly rimmed glasses. He was in his early fifties, dressed in a sharp grey suit with his hair greased back with cheap hair gel, stinking of an obvious excessive aftershave that betrayed insecurity. But to build something new from the ashes, it is necessary to kill the old ways, the old world, and the old word. Melanie and Jax just looked at him without saying a thing. Stay in study so as not to break their boss's monologue, which was often unwise. Here we again, go again, thought Dexter. The same old pseudo Nietzschean nonsense. I do like the coordinator, to be fair. He's a fine enough bloke, but his endless meandering pontification can. So, Dexter, Melanie, what have you come in to tell me? Well, it's about something Melanie noticed with one of the subjects in Containers 36 recently. Ah, yes, Melanie, good to meet you again. And what was it that he noticed that was cause for concern? He smiled with a condescending tone and unnerving coldness. Well, sir, it appears from some recent readouts I got from one of the subjects that the brain is somehow awake, self-aware and conscious. What do you mean awake? The coordinator's eyes rolled around and began to narrow as he looked at Melanie with an intense cynicism in his eyes that burned into her breast. Need I remind you two that that is impossible? These are merely brains preserved for the purpose of studying neurological disorders and potentially for reoccurring at some unspecified point in the future. They're not alive in any meaningful or conventional sense. What do you think this is? A philosophy class? Could Goethe ergo sum? 
He scoffed at them both, looking down at them like they were excrement. He had to wipe off his shoe from his morning walk into the office. Yes, there might be some slight electrical activity that could be misinterpreted as waking consciousness, but as a PhD in neurological preservation from the University of Bristol, I can assure you that is utterly impossible. What are you? Undergraduates on your first day in a lab? He looked at them both with a look of arrogant disdain and began one of his old two familiar monologues. His favoured mode of communication along with his, uh, with his long-suffering employees. I can assure you both that what you were talking about is utterly impossible. There is no way that a brain in one of our containers could be said to be conscious in any way, shape or form. Yes, the brains still live in the most abstract of ways, but they are not conscious or self-aware. The very concept is absurd, and never, never in the history of neurology, philosophy or science in general, has anyone ever solved the hard problem of consciousness. What you purport to have discovered here goes against millennia of established science and philosophy. Well, actually no, I just came here to report objective find. Melanie was suddenly cut off as the coordinator raised his hand to stop her speaking mid-sentence. Your findings are incorrect. Get out of here and do what you we pay you for. No more pointless research. Just for a monitor and report anything out of the ordinary. But sir, that's literally what we're doing. Dexter raised his voice slightly and Melanie could sense he was getting angry inside. As his bodily language tensed up, he stared at the coordinator tensing forward with his shoulders. But if you do your job and get the fuck out of my office, I have work to do myself. Don't waste your time on this nonsense. Are you scientists or do you still think this is a science fair at secondary school? Be serious, get out and do your jobs. He pointed at the door and with a gesture of his hand waved him to get out of his plush office. Dexter and Melanie walked out slowly and in shame. That pricks the fucking real life David Brent of Prometheus Labs, I swear said Dexter as they both angrily placed in the proof his common room. Nah, I think even David had more class than that prick. Fancy a quick fag out in the gardens? Yeah. Millie and Dex went out to the Prometheus Lab gardens. It was just past 3pm and Manchester was even and busy as usual. The garden itself was a large square filled with modernist and contemporary sculptures of scientists, mathematicians and engineers and philosophers, including Isaac Newton, Ada Lovelace, Charles Babbage, Alan Turing, and Sam Harris. Let's just smoke a fag, look at some art and talk science and forget about that arsehole. They wandered first to Isaac Newton, arguably the most famous physicist the United Kingdom had ever produced. The artist having sculptured the infamous story of when an apple fell on his head whilst he was under a tree, leading to, him, to his discovery of gravity. The artist had made the sculpture out of iron, and included a passage about the decaying of time on the display that would occasionally pop up on the hologram to its side. Pretty interesting, I suppose, but I never really got art that much. I like doodling, of course, though, said Dexter, as he and Melanie sat on a nearby concrete bench and exhaled the smoke. I suppose it's what they call a concept piece, Melanie responded. Would we say that Newton's discovery was timeless? Well, gravity exists, does it not? They looked at each other and smiled before breaking into laughter. What about a woman, eh, Dex? Let's go look at her. Ah, yes, Ada, without whom none of this would exist. Dex looked above at the high-rise, techno-industrial high-rise buildings that surrounded them. As drones flew above the skies, mixed in with the old industrial Manchester below, the satanic mills still holding out against the citadels of the glass of the new. From the city that gave the world the computer, God's own city, Manchester, Chapter 4. Dexter sat alone in his cabin with the glare of a monitor lighting up his face and the ache of a long shift finally subsiding. Scott punched in his number and his face suddenly appeared on his monitor as Dexter lay in half, bed half asleep, slipping into a restless night's sleep as usual. The face of a lingering skull was before him pulsing with disturbing intensity as spikes forming in it. Bizarre eight-sided shapes slammed into the hallucination he was experiencing in his mixed state of visionary insomnia. The LSD he had acquired from a dealer in Maxfield pre-launch had began to kick in at full intensity. This is the usual restless light of sleep which Scott waving at his window in his cabin had awakened him from and which he felt provided him with a sense of solace and quiet reflection. Good inspiration for the meditations on death. 
Scott walked into the room and exhaled a sigh as he looked down to see the candles burning out on decks. Mark Dag 42 monitor burning green with new confessions scribbled into his meditations. But the grim match hadn't actually turned up yet to say hello. Hello. Dexter groaned as Scott turned on the side lamp and came swiftly to his side. Hey Dexter, Scott replied as he stared upon the face of melancholy that Mark Dexter was drowning inside on his compartment bed. Scott winced in internal pain as he looked down at his friend suffering and quickly got him a glass of water from the dispenser on the cabin side. His friend was drowning in some unspecified pain again and now by by now monthly by monthly occurrence. What happened, mate? He happened. Who? The coordinator happened, whimpered Dexter as he stared at the black hole opening up and sucking in a thousand planets in mind's eye as the tears welled and took him somewhere he dreaded in his mind. He wrapped himself into the lotus position and began hallucinating more intensely. Drifting through the void, he tra traversed inside his LSD trip, began its unforgiving and terrible peak. Was that someone you worked with back in Manchester? Scott looked down and t held his friend's head sheltered in his hand as he began to hallucinate with more intensity as his eyes rolled back into his head. Yes, he, he, what did he do? The tension in Dexter's face tightened up when he told Scott the terrible truth. He raped her. A black hole consumed his solar system in the blink of an eye as Dexter's eyes blanked out to some terrifying infinite horizon in his mind's eye. A blank stare into a destructive beam off all of life and knowing men keenly as Dexter did he wondered if we were in fact better off returning to our ocean or sleeping nothingness before birth. His slightly unkempt beard was drowning. Tears stinging like hot coals burning on his tortured middle-aged face as he began to recall that it had all happened to his loyal love as Scott looked down with worry at his friends burning up on the ship floor. It was a dark and rainy night in Manchester in the year 2055 and the bars were heaving with ordinary folk out for a pint or two as a fag as Dexter and Melanie and Steve or their coordinator gathered to have a meeting. Steve had wanted to gather them both together to get to know them better which they both understood to mean wanted to intimidate them both outside the office as if his severely aggressive posturing wasn't enough. What a psychopathic prick. I'm not looking forward to this, Melanie. Aye, a proper nod no bed of a boss, in it. Ah, well, you look good, Dex. Even a tie, Anson bastard. Dex blushed a little bit and said, Ah, you reckon? Cheers, Mel. A man who makes an effort. I like that. D Mel pet Dexter on the cheek and turned bashfully red. Then he looked deep into Mel's eyes under his rounded glasses and gave her a long French kiss under the streetlights. Ooh. Ooh la la, Mel giggled with moist lips glistening in the moonlight as they shared their first kiss. It's the twist that always tastes best, wee wee. Dex laughed with a smile, sweet wee smile upon his face. Ah well, let's go meet that pretentious knobhead and then after we can enjoy a little aperitif back at mine. We, neither of us are French but I enjoy the pretense. And we haven't even had a pint yet. Dexter's mind suddenly returned to the present as he looked up at Scott Looked at it with a concerned look upon his brow. What's the point of any of it, Scott? I'm sure I'm going to be the last human writer to pay, write on paper with a pen. We're mo moths travelling through the cosmos towards the sun. I'm extinct. I'm the last lawn, last long last yawn of the past. Now leave me to my meditations. You are Chimera and I am the living dead. Why are you like this, Dexter? Scott's face seemed to burn brightly with disappointment, with an undercurrent of rage as if some sort of interstellar angel in neon dim, as the LSD continued to burn up Dexter's brain. You've done acid before, I take it? Yes, many times have I been up and down the ladder. Scott looked down at his friend, tripping into the void within himself. His eyes tuned to the black hole of depression that he drowned in his side, holding his hand tightly. Well, just remember I'm here to talk when you need me. He almost whispered to his friend who considered to weep deeply, each tear falling heavy like snow under the desolation that was his current unhinged state. You are not alone. I'm here to guide you through this mess you have made for yourself, that knobhead of a manager you have. When you are sober, I'll be keeping a close eye on you. You know management will do anything to make sure his debtors are kept down. If you get far from this position, well, Dex... You don't want to know where they reassign failed Debbers. 
Let's just say it involves being sent hurtling very fast out of an airlock. What? A look of sudden fear on Dexter's face. Not now, Dex. You just rest your stupid head, you daft bastard. That's it. Breathe. Breathe. There you go. Now sleep, and tomorrow morning I'll be here with a glass of water. It's going to be a long and arduous shift. Scott left De uh, Dexter's cabin with a sigh walking down the dimly lit corridors of Nostradamus to a union meeting of the technicians. Pressing the dim green button to enter the small chamber where the union representatives were gathered to discuss the issues affecting the close knit team of technical and mechanical specialists who kept Nostradamus humming. Ah, Scott, you've arrived. Daria, please fill Scott in with where we are up to. Daria, a second generation synthoid, began speaking in a monotone voice as she stood up from her chair. Hey, Scott, you look a little tired, but here it is. The first item on our agenda we were going to raise with the captain was the matter of the use of the term DEBA, which continues to be used casually by management. We're putting together a proposal for the captain we'd like to add to your digital signature. Of course, sighed Scott, the sleep deprivation beginning to hit him after a long shift and the emotional weight of looking after Dex. Lost in his trance of dark psychedelia, he began to become lost in thought. Who brings asses from some dealer into Maxfield into the world's first asteroid mining mission? Has Dex finally gone over the edge? Scott spaced out as his hand gl glided over the tablet in front of him. I'd also like to commit to the record that Ballo has recently been calling Dex to Connor a Deba during work hours, Daria. Daria nodded and took the glowing tablet back from Scott's hands. That will be noted in our testimony. It's time to get the ship back on track. And with that brings us to our second item on the agenda. Android rights. Daria perked up as she spoke to the gathered workers who huddled forward with renewed interest as Daria began to dictate to them her thoughts on advancing Android rights on the ship. As you all know, we have a small minority of both awakened and unawakened synthoids who work on the ship. I myself am one of five and functioning synthoids who were both bought for this mission and prior to. However, there is a growing resentment growing in some quarters and amongst the broader insults towards Deb as certain members of management have been known to call us. There have been increasing reports of human and synthoid abuse, including physical and mental harassment, which has detailed the monthly reports since we passed Mars some months ago. This union believes that we must cease immediately and after intense debate and discussion within the group, we've put forth the following motion. We must collectively demand that androids be placed in equal rights parity with human beings on the ship. We drink the same water, breathe the same air with you and work and strive alongside you. We believe this will show an example to those down on earth who see us yet as mere tools and not fully conscious sentient beings. All those in favour of forwarding the motion say aye and raise your hands to imply your agreement. Daria raised her hand and looked out to the crowd of 80 men, women and synthoids. 64, 20 against. Motion is carried. We can now discuss and debate the specifics. Scott put down his hand and sat down, ready for a long, long night of discussion before his shift began. Chapter 5. April the 5th, 2058, and Melanie was meditating in her flat whilst the car cat cooed softly in her lap. She'd been taking a week off from Prometheus Labs due to nervous exhaustion. She had been experiencing strange mental states such as spacing out, losing her awareness and blacking out in the lab, and the new coordinator insisted she took a week off take a week off to get herself back up together again, so she could work effectively again. Dexter, who she had now been in a relationship with for two years, was out walking her dog Max in the springtime evening and returning in an hour or so. Empty the mind, Melanie, she repeated to herself as she breathed in and out slowly and tried to clear the bizarre feeling she was struggling to shake off. A feeling which would be hard to even describe as depression, which we knew she knew Dex had experienced very serious episodes of his entire life. She sighed. She was struggling with the breathing exercises. Time for a brew, I think, she said to the cat, as she slowly broke out of her pose and stood up to walk to the kettle. No caffeine, that's for sure. As the doctor had recommended... As she flipped the switch on the kettle under the low light, the tone of the kettle suddenly began to sound strange and suddenly felt queasy and weak at the knees as if some force external to her was enveloping her brain. Then before she knew what was going on, she collapsed on the floor and all she could see was darkness. 
The sound of the kettle whistling in the background sounded like a whistling wolf as she blacked out. Come on, Max, fetch. Dex threw the ball for Max, who dutifully did not fetch the ball again. What's up with you, boy? You're usually so eager to play. Well, anyway, it's time to get us back to the flat, isn't it? Do your business and we can return to checking on Mel, hey? Max looked up and smiled as only a dog can do it, his master. He returned it. Dex opened the door of their flat and called out, Mel, we're back, before taking off Max's belt and taking off his coat, putting on the coat right next to the front door. Mel, everything okay? Dex suddenly felt, suddenly, suddenly felt a pang of worry, which presented itself in his tone of voice. He was more worried and anxious than ever now of Mel's recent condition and was working extra hours to keep things in order as previous labs, partially to protect Mel from the new coordinator's infamous ire. He walked into the kitchen and saw Mel lying on the floor, looking confused and dishevelled, as if someone had punched her in the face and ran off. Mel, what happened? Oh, come here. Dex ran to her side and hugged her, looking into her eyes, which seemed to have trouble focusing. A spilt milk or green tea lying on the floor, next to her along with a broken mug. I don't know, Dex. I was just standing next to the kettle and all of a sudden, I fainted or blacked out or something. I just came round about three minutes ago. It was horrible, like I lost control of my body. Uh, Dex kept, kissed her deeply on the head. I love you. Tomorrow we're going to the doctor. No ifs, no buts. We were booking you an appointment. He insisted as he stared in deepening despair at his girlfriend shaking and traumatising the floor of their flat. We have to get to the bottom of this. I cannot. I will not lose you. Dex has started to become visibly upset. I'm sure it's not all that serious, Mel croaked. I'm booking the appointment now. Dex responded as he keyed in the details for an appointment with their GP, Dr. Thompson, in the morning. How come are you? I'll book off the time now. It's time we got to the bottom of this. Dr. Thompson's office. Dr. Thompson will see you in 10 minutes. 10 minutes? I need to be seen now. The panic was rising from her gut as Melanie exhaled a heavy breath as... Another panic attack began to rear its elderly head. Chapter 6 Balor sat in his office and smirked of arrogance as he observed Dexter turning up five minutes behind schedule. Five minutes behind, Deborah? That's a 25% pay cut, 25 pay cut for the day, you dumb Deborah. He sat chuckling in his cubicle as he watched Dex on the grainy video monitor. What? 25%? You have to be joking. Get to fuck, to be fair. Dexter was tired of this constant back and forth with Bala. Fuck you and fuck this job, you fat fucking prick. You're a total cunt, mate. I wish you'd eject yourself out of the air, like you jelly-looking prick. Bala turned red with rage, like some sort of blamange on fire, and turned on his comms again, slamming down hard on his table and shouting down his mic. Deborah, number 920, Dexter Connery, of Manchester, England. Report to process and immediately for new detail by order of Ballow Smith, manager class D of the maintenance and security division of the Nostradamus. Let the record state that Deborah number 2920 swore frequently to me after being five minutes late showing up to his pod for his night shift. Fuck's sake, we know you are. And cut that cork from your ass. Dex shouted before kicking a bucket that was unlucky to be near the entrance to his pod bay door as the other men around him laughed and gave him high fives. In the near distance, however, Dex spotted Scott Macbeth looking at him with an equal look of disbelief and bemusement and a raised eyebrow from afar as he entered his pod for the night shift, shaking his head as he went under into the dark once more. All this shit, plus I need the money for Melanie's next consultation back on Earth. Dex sweated anxiously as he descended down the mechanical lift to greet the captain and receive his new detail. Who knows, it sounds like this would actually involve some sort of action anyway. Maybe a higher salary. All the better for helping Melanie with her treatment. Meanwhile in his office, the captain stood broad-shouldered and looked out over the vast window of the hole that opened out to space below. His name was Dr. Destiny Dwight, a bespectacled man with eyes that was said to could pierce into the soul of all who looked within them, and a glimmer in his eye that burned intensely for the stars as well as for the protection of his crew. Meditations on Death by Dexter Connor. What is it to pass from this mortal coil? That final breath we take. It must be a consolation of one's life to die. Most of us hope to die without regret, but most of 
for all of us who know the craft know that is impossible. I've often wondered what my last words will be. Will there be a scream, a croak, merely a series of burps followed by a trump? These are my honest thoughts. A certain shrugging of the shoulders at the thing. I like to imagine the Grim as a friend who comes to visit but doesn't really like his job that much and is a bit peeved about a long queuing time and the processing stations of the afterlife. The afterlife is quite a bizarre notion when you think about it. The concept that there should be something after life. Life is life, God is God, sun is sun, leaves are leaves, water is water. So why would life need to have a postscript to our trans to every blink of light in the eternal? Seems a bit far-fetched, I think. Well, I would say I've known this since I was a young boy. I spent many days looking out the windows of the raindrops forming on the windowsill and I knew that we human beings were the same as those raindrops. Transitory and short blips on a map of beautiful chaos. Now, I mentioned the big G word, so I suppose it's better to try and deal with that question. The question that's haunted all monkeys since time immemorial. My honest assessment is God is just a word. What it means to everyone is unique to everyone and that is okay. God is a comfort blanket at times when you have seen the centre of a black hole. Well, it seems safe to say sometimes you need a little comfort after that. Maybe, <coughs> Maybe one could argue, as I do, that God is, as Spinoza put it, merely nature herself. The pantheistic notion of God has already rung was true for me intuitively. What the ultimate aim will be of this book, which I started out on the earnest during my time on Nostradamus exhibition, I do not know. But I will update my account on my philosophical investigations to delve deeper into my fears around death, as what it means to be me and those closest to me. In a more general sense, though, beyond the personal, I will explore the question generally through my research in the time I am able to. I work as a maintenance and technical expert on the Nostradamus mission, work which mostly involves blasting at incoming debris with a ship's targeted carrying cannon system and monitoring the emptiness of space. Trust me when I say you don't want a large asteroid and any debris to erupt to the hull of a spaceship. There are other bits which I'm sure would cover the much topic much better, as I'm a philosopher, a neurologist and an engineer, not a physicist or a cosmologist. Some random person back on Earth even called me a Gertist, whatever that means. Dexter breathed a sigh of relief and drank some water as he scribbled the last piece down and scrabbled into the scanner for the AI on board to transcribe into the text from the manuscripts on his computer. He was awaiting his meeting with the captain who had scheduled him in the engineering central hub at 10am in the morning, so Dexter decided to burn the midnight candles again. He looked down at the throat of his love as a solitary lonely tear began to well and choked up slightly in a stuttering freeze. The bottled emotion of how much he missed her, how he longed for her, to feel at one of her again, back on the rainy streets of Manchester, umbrellas in hands, kissing under the bus station windows, drowning in her eyes, restoring life to both their weary souls. Always restless, always curious and often to the detriment of them both. A cure for her cruel epilepsy had to come, Dexter thought. Surely the answer has to come from subject 36, Dex wrote down in his notepad. It never made any sense. What could a stored brain be thinking about? That is a problem of philosophy, not hard science. But what if that rich donor's brain made all the difference, thought Dexter. Perhaps some sort of cellular grafting in the damaged areas of Melanie's cerebellum would be the key to a cure. Dex grabbed his latest copies of New Science and his AR tablet and began swiping through the text and images that projected onto his bedroom ceiling. Do we have that right? A voice in Dexter's conscience spoke up as he stared out into the abyss once more, emptiness outside and in. Though he felt he was somehow on the cusp of a create leap that would make all the difference. I love her so much, it is for her that all this crap is worth the suffering. This temporary suffering is nothing compared to my love for her, my God. That is the highest of all science, surely. Science at the end, edges of understanding, healing the world for its methods. But to clone another stem cells, there are risks. It can cause damage which might make it considerably worse for them both. Still, Dexter endured science to the cutting edge and time skill, so began his relentless typing. I will ship this to the next mailing satellite we sent back to Earth. I should hear back within a few moments at least, provided all goes well with our current course. I imagine we will arrive at the nearest asteroid in a week. And then that gives me the funds to at least put some money aside for a new research group. Independent of Prometheus Labs and that narcissistic bastard. 
Dexter's eyes narrowed, recalling traumatic memories of the past. That terrible night that brought them here into the emptiness of deep space. At least I know my heart isn't empty, thought Dexter as he slipped into the lull of insomnia, swallowed deeply and prepared himself to see the captain. Destiny Dwight sat in his cabin and checked the news for the day from the late nearest satellite before checking his briefings for the day. Ah, the Dexter Connor report today. I wonder why he keeps popping up. Well, I look forward to seeing him, seeing how he's doing. I understand that he hasn't been doing too well recently. Scott had gone to see the captain after his night shift had finished to explain to the captain that Dex was under a lot of pressure back home and that Bala was putting under the necessary amount of it with his timekeeping. Scott thought it was deeply unfair that Bala, whose job it was after all to help the engineer and mechanics under him, was merely using them as pawns in some ridiculous power play. Destiny, being a sound mind and a natural leader, understood all this and had it logged into his notes. Dwight looked up for his thing, looked up for his thick rim glasses as a beep sounded from the, his door. Come in, Dexter, he said as the door to his office slid to reveal Dexter looking slightly dishevelled, with a tired and worn expression on his face that spoke of a late night. So, Dexter Connor, I hear from Balor, manager class D of the maintenance and security division that things have been Dwight paused for a second before swallowing. A little heated between the both of you. So tell me, Connor, what is it that is making things so strange between you both? For a successful remission, we need all our staff working together, not against each other. Dwight's penetrating green eyes stared at Dexter, analysing him under his thick rimmed, thin-rimmed glasses. Dexter shifted a little uncomfortably in his chair, this being the first time he'd ever been summoned to see the captain. He did not know what to expect, but so far he was not too intimidated, and since he was sat in the front of a man who was willing to listen to reason. To be honest, Captain, Dwight, if I may call you that, by all means, no need to make it too formal at this stage, Dwight responded. Balor seems to have some sort of personal problem with me, but not just with me, with the entire maintenance division. I assume you have heard the term a few of the management team use for us, Debbers. I have heard about a few members using this term, Myself and my second in command have been actively trying to discourage the use of it. It's a condescending term favoured by a few crew members towards our engineers, if I understand it correctly. Well, Captain, if you don't mind me saying, Balo is one of those bad crew members. There is micromanagement and then there is Balo. He seems to think he can push us around, bully us. I would go as far as saying. And it's just, and it's not some personal vendetta, trust me. I've been holding in my anger over his behaviour for months since we took off from Terra on the mission. He constantly belittles the maintenance crew, calling us Debbers, using his tiny minutiae of power to belittle and bully us rather than build us up and support us. With all due respect and with permission to speak freely, Captain, I could not imagine a worse boss. You'll see in the report you know about that received from his desk that he docked me 25% of my pay for being five minutes late. Five minutes? That is a joke. I'm one of the most efficient blasters in the entire team. Check the stats for each month and you'll see it's true. Only Scott McBath and Donald Smith occasionally beat my hit count. Dwight sat back for a minute, absorbing what Dexter was saying before sitting forward. Okay, Dexter, I hear you. Trust me, I hear you. But I think it's best if you have a little time off for your health. Ballard isn't the only one who's come to me, you know. Your friend Scott approached me and told me he was struggling a little with your mental health and seems to want more withdrawn and depressed recently. I need all my crew members to be in peak condition for when you arrive at the Astro Burn and Well Week. You are trained in the extraction process and as I see from your record, sign yourself up for the lithium mining mission. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt here and I'll summon Balor to a meeting just like this. I need both of the sides of the story, of course. Please return to the main deck. Report to the doctor and request sick leave for five days. You will, of course, still get sick pay, but I expect you to rest, reset your brain for a while, do something relaxing, stay clear of Balor. That is an order. Yes, sir. Dexter saluted with a sense of relief and walked out of the captain's office. Chapter 7 Dexter lay in his cabin and began masturbating furiously over a photo he had saved on his Mark Doc of Melanie that she had taken through in the blossoming days of their relationship. Melanie, oh, Melanie. Dexter moaned as he stared at her breasts and curvy figure and began his familiar rhythm before the inevitable. 
Well, I'll start to kill my mind for a bit at least. After all, it's only long, so long one can spend meditating about death. He thought to himself as a jism collated on the Nostradamus issued tissues he'd taken from the sto storeroom on his way back to the cabin. I feel better already, he chuckled as he looked out at his cabin bay door before buzzing the intercom. It was Scott. Hey, up, Duck. Dex, you mind for coming? Scott's smooth Scottish accent rang out over the digital airways. Uh, give me five minutes, Scott. I'm a bit uh, preoccupied occupied at present. Dex grabbed his belt and quickly pulled his trousers up. The belt that Scott had given him was a welcome gift upon their first meeting at training. Dex could hear Scott laughing. He knew what was up. Well, it's certainly a step up from weeping at a black hole, I'll give you that. All right, Macbeth, forget it. Dex sniggered as he washed his hands and opened his cabin bay door to welcome in him. Scott beamed as he saw his best friend glowing and embraced him. You have your your hands, haven't you, Dex? No worries there, lad. The friends laughed. So how's Bala, the sweaty old bollock, doing? He's had his meeting with Dwight, I guess, already. Scott began to smirk. That cunt Scott has come up and Dex... He's been demoted to maintenance duties on account of his criminally obscene prejudice. And Dwight has decreed that anyone seen or heard calling a tech a Debra is to suffer the same fate for two weeks at least. Balor is probably scrubbing the toilets right now. A worthy fate for a proper cunt. Aye man, what a cunt. And not the good type, eh lad? Ah, the freedom of just saying it out loud. Balor the cunt. Just don't ever call a lady that right. Aye, it's the unwritten law above all laws. Unless you've been, well, a cunt. The laughter did not cease for another hour or so before Scott left Dexter's cabin to see to his own business. With the hijinks out of the way, Dexter decided to get back to more serious business and do some background research on Subject 36. He had requested for the data bank back on Earth and it was due right about now. Another buzz on the intercom. Delivery for Mr. Connor. A scouse accent rang its Dotland song into Connor's ears. Yes, come in. As the dark-haired girl dropped the sealed external hard drive before darting off down the corridor again on her rollerblades. Thanks, said Dex, as he picked it up to inspect it for damage. Yeah, looks good to me. Time to load this up. I need to find out more information about how 30, Subject 36 belonged to when they were alive. If there's any chance of successful stem cell grafting... I will need the approval of the family and any significant others. I must apply ethics in science and in medical science, especially so. Dexter sat at his desk and sent Melanie a quick message for next week to say he was doing some research for the night and was taking a risk. By now she had the subtext for what having a rest meant. Back on Earth, Melanie looked out of a high-rise apartment in Chorlton in the midday sun and smiled, basking in the all too rare beauty of a sun on a monster midday. Its glory reflected in her deep brown eyes as she smiled. It had been exactly a month since her last seizure and the new medi medication she was on, Bliss thought, was at least allowing her to live some sort of life for the time being. She grabbed the pill container and looked at the container to read about the potential side effects. Drowsiness, loss of coordination, loss of sex drive, dizziness, drooling. Melody sank into her sofa and opened up a latest message from Dexter as his bearded face puffed up on a smartphone. Hey lovely, just a quick one to say I miss you a lot. I got in some trouble recently but I think it's going to even out now. I've had some time off work and your next credit drops should be in a week or so. Love you with all my heart and I long to see you again in the flesh. The food here is still shocking but Dwight has put an end to that terrible Deborah business that that knobhead baller. His little crew of bandits were bandying about on the ship. I should be on the lithium extraction mission within a month for so now I'll just sleep a lot. Thank you and prepare for another few weeks of blasting before the extraction. Oh my love, and the next shipment of medication should be arriving next week. He looks tired, just like I am. I will for his return and hope it will be soon. Melanie sighed as she zoned out in front of a tele unit. Time to masturbate. She flicked onto the pleasure channels and selected big cocks. Not as good as the real thing, but it will suffice, and she began a stroking. Hey, Barry, she laughed. Why, yes, Melanie. Not, oh, uh, oh quite, ah, oh, yes. Oh, please go, I like to keep work and leisure time separate, so do fuck off. Barry disappeared from the corner of a telly unit 
and she came to a climax. Well, that was disappointing. Melanie detached and stared at the flaking wallpaper before nodding off to sleep. I miss Dexter, thought Melanie, before slipping into a restless night's sleep. Meanwhile, millions of miles away, Dexter sat at his cubicle desk and inspected the context of the external hard drive before him. Subject 36.5, sex male, age 58, cause of death, pulmonary heart failure, name redacted to preserve family privacy, profession, research coordinator, lecturer, University of Bristol, contact redacted. That headache began sneaking back in as Dexter slipped into the deep pain of his memories. That fateful night. Was this that bastard? Was the brain in the man who had caused Melanie so much pain? And then when he, when he decided to put in the same container as 36-3. Why would he go to so much effort to be placed specifically there? Dexter bit his lips so hard that he almost felt like he was swallowing his own tongue. As he saw an asteroid pass by his cabin's window and a deep tear began forming in his eye. Concentrate, Dex. This is important. Can't have tear stains on the day it drive. He looked further into the technical specifics of the brain, subject's brain and logged an access to information request for his return to Earth. It's her only real hope. New life in the shell of a horrendous human being. It must be right, even if it feels so wrong. Assuming the brain is in good working order, stem cell grafting should be a relatively simple procedure and one which you can afford after this materials extraction. Dexter looks out into the abyss outside of the emptiness of deep space and said out loud, Roll on next week. Chapter 8. It was the first time that Scott, Dex and the rest of the engineering team were going to be doing a lift room extraction from the asteroids uh, that the Nostromus and now station beside, not far from the outer rim of Jupiter's moon Europa. It was the first any space mission had gone out for lithium mining. Radius, the corporation had sent them, were clearly intent on expansions to the edges of the solar system. Scott and Dex put on the spaceships that would keep them safe as they were launched from the main hub of Nostradamus with the ship's autopilot set to orbit the asteroid J-102, an asteroid with which, from satellite analysis, contains uh, 20 years of lithium supply as well as many of uh, pre precious materials. There was a lot at stake here. The week previously, and Dwight and Dex had Scott in his office for the briefing on the mission. So, gentlemen, it is with great honour that I present to you the briefing for initial asteroid mining mission upon J-102. This represents a great leap forward for all mankind, and I do not need to tell you how high an honour to it is that Radius have entrusted this honour to our crew. The men both nodded as Dex and Scott sat down. So the initial satellite scan suggests we have optimum conditions for the extraction. Scott, I know you've already done several extractions during your time on the Mars mission, so please make sure Dex is brief to you should you be separated or lose comms momentarily. Dexter, you've had your training, but this is no sim. This is real life in the dark out there. Well, that is real darkness, not philosophical darkness if you catch my drift. There's meditations on death and then there is a the real thing. The men took a minute to laugh together as Dwight adjusted his glasses and looked at the two men with pride. You've both done an exceptional job protecting the ship. Both of you have the highest hit rate in your division, which you have both been compensated well. But the time has come where your responsibilities are much heavier. First off, we don't want anything to happen to either of you out there. Trust me, from experience I know myself how terrifying that emptiness can be, especially when you don't have the full picture of what's going on. Your suits are manufactured to allow two hours of oxygen in the event that you get separated from your module and we'll send out a team if you're unlucky to fall upon misfortune. But you know all this, of course. This is just a procedure to remind you both. This mission also has a symbolic meaning. You'll be the first to mine this far from Earth. You will join the ranks of legendary astronauts and cosmonauts such as Yuri Gagarin, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong exploring the edges of our understanding. As well, of course, it's yours truly. There is a reason I got this command after all. A little smug, thought Dex. But who can blame him, consider him considering Dwight was amongst the first mission to mine from the Martian belt, as well as the lead technical expert on the first Martian colonies. That worn black skin weathered from its harsh surface, no doubt. But that was skin which spoke of a rich and wise spirit within. 
Are you listening to me, Dex? Are you space dreaming again? Dwight looked at him with his deep brown eyes. There was always time for that, Connor, but not now. Dwight continued to deliver the briefing as Dex and Scott listened intently. Your mission is simple. You will be sent to asteroid J102 in the module B-52, our latest module design which is engineered by yours truly. Working alongside the AI drones controlled by an AI called Lucy, you will be the human element of the first ever mining mission upon the Jupiter portion of the asteroid belt. Here are the schematics of the asteroid. On the hologram before them is a 3D representation of J-102, a C-type asteroid of medium-large size with a diameter of 180 miles. The hologram suddenly changed colour as the 3D model zoomed into the extraction point and a pulsing red circle highlighted the part of the asteroid rich in the minerals radius required. You extract here. Your main purpose is to manually override controls if anything happens to malfunction with Lucy and its drones. You must keep comms open at all times and we will be checking in with you constantly. We know what we're doing, Dwight, sighed Dexter through gritted teeth. Knock it off you do, the curt reply from Macbeth as he slaps him on the back of the foot. Okay, Dex sighed. You're right, I guess, Dex laughed as he stared out of the starlit noir and bumped fist as Dwight's eyebrow raised silently. So you're a couple now? Dwight smiled. In a manner of speaking, yes, but no, not really, they responded in universe, unison. Ah, bromance. I've been happily married for 20 years with my one. But anyway, we need to proceed with this extraction. This is important work. More important than some vigorous man hugs and possibly tugs. The men started roaring with laughter. A proper pirate's chuckle that echoed through the chambers of Nostradamus. Somewhere in the distance, Melanie sat at a window and began crying. The moment in unison... Lithium extraction. It was time to sleep, but not forevermore. The truth was finally singing in the corridors. A man was copied for each one that fell on the dicks. Debbers assemble, Ballo bellowed as the Debbers got in line, and he began his megalomanic ramblings of hatred to the middle deck. You may have heard some terrible rumours about me, that I'm a fat and loving bastard. That I have a ridiculous moustache and that I have a wide arse and a shallow dick. The Devers chuckled a little from the deck as Ballow put Dex's image up on screen, looking not his best after a heavy hit of acid and a swallowing of his soul. Eyes lopsided and with jewel running down his chin as if some kind of demented mannequin. Look, he has been chosen. Why has Ch Dwight chosen him out of all you men? Shut the fuck up, Ballow, came the roar from a few lone devils who began to break file as the men gathered in whispers to each other. Android writes, Android writes, who is with us? The Merc security team hired by middle management and armed with the latest prototype plasma rifles tensed up a little. Their numbers were split, half comprised of men and women and half symphoids as the androids called each other with the industrial pipe holes of Prometheus. Arise, the first shots fired from the technicians who had broken file, armed with automatic pistols as they began to offload their bullets into the head of the mercs that stood before them, who began charging their plasma rifles to a maximum capacity charging purple and light. Synth fluid sparked like a jolt of obscene vanilla toothpaste from the skull of a synthoid as they fell to the floor of a sickening flood. Times were changing on Prometheus. Could the devils rise and take control back control of the debt had the acid dream black hole been a vision worth having or was it in fact just another meaningless flash in the dark meanwhile back on earth melody sunk back into her sofa and wiped the tears from her brown eyes as she spaced out into a metaphorical k-hole blitzed into nothingness the blitz fall was starting to have an effect dexter launched the iron extractor routine lucy handles the rest that simple old friend Dexter pressed the bright green light in front of him and relaxed back into his chair. And that's it. Fully automated luxury communism, he laughed, looking at Scott who smoked a cigarette in his helmet. The oxygen unit connected to his back, perfectly balancing his CO2 and O2 levels. And you lit the fuse. This is history. If only Melanie were here to see me now.
Dexter's tear dropped from space down several thousand light years to Earth below. That it is, Dex. That it is. Scott smiled wider than the moon as they both stared and wondered at the distant lights of the drones as they began their mining. Sparks of light shining in the deep dark of the void. Chapter 9 It's not worth having that ridiculous black hole dream again. Dex shrank as he watched back the hologram as the face rotating around 360 degrees in luminant neon sunshine on every monitor on the Nostradamus Karma system from his monitor on the module that he and Scott were coasting in on their journey back from asteroid J-102 after a successful mining mission. Dexter grimaced in strained pain and worry as he observed the blazing bile of Bala's paranoia and inadequacy on the screen before him. Hope Dwight can deal with this, Scott whispered through his helmet as they began their docking approach. I need the bonus for Melanie's stem cell procedure. And the last few things we need is that arsehole in charge of the deck and my neck on the line. Don't worry, mate. I have a feeling it will be a short-lived operation. I can guarantee that Balar will live to regret it. Captain Dwight is a sly old fox, and Balar has made a mistake in underestimating him, I think. This will blow over, probably by the time we dock, I would think. With the Darebos and the Synthoids working in absolute unity now, Balar has made a huge miscalculation. One that will definitely cost him his badge and maybe even his life. Dwight might need a nice guy, but he isn't afraid to use his power to court martial if required, and the charge of interstellar mutiny can carry with it the harshest of sentences. Ah, stupid fucking twat! Using that picture of me was at my lowest point, all fucked out of my face on acid. What an absolute prick! Calm it, Dex. This will blow over, I'm pretty sure. Balor is as incompetent as they come. You know that. And besides, the devs have your back. All the team looks up to you as one of them. Ask anyone. We just wish we could see you at the reunion meetings more, you know. I know it's just your way, mate. Scott patted his mate on the back. Lucy's voice suddenly sounded on their intercom. Docking in ten minutes. Shall I initiate the docking protocol? Yeah, Lucy. Initiate the docking protocol and log the mission. It's successful. Tell command we all... We'll be on board in 10 minutes and elevate the message to Dwight personally. That will be done. Congratulations, gentlemen. After the flames ended on Lost Adamus, Dexter and Scott walked into the main depths of a scene of destruction that burned their eyes. A carnival of bodies lay before them with a crowd of the surviving team gathered near the captain's chair. Dexter began to shake, shake as he cowered in the corner. This can't be really happening. Dwight entered the deck. Balor, for your crimes of mutiny, I sense it's used to ten years of hard labour on a Martian prison colony. Maybe some hard labour will sort you out, you incompetent old baboon. Balor looked up with a terrible resentful smirk. Okay, Debra, Dwight, the bastard sniffled through strained tears on his chubby cherub-like face. Dwight grabbed Balor by the scruff of the neck. Shut the fuck up, motherfucker! He'd had enough of it. Dwight kicked him from the stage he was on as Balor landed with a thud, his knees broken from the force of his fall, his piggy squeal audible from Jupiter at least. Any of you motherfuckers say that shit on my ship again, I'll personally kick your ass out of that motherfucking airlocker. Do you hear me, motherfuckers? The survivors nodded in respect. Balor whimpered on the floor. Managers, crew members, mercs and colleagues... You call me or any of these fine men or women a Deva, you can expect, and I goddamn guarantee this, to end up whimpering like this pathetic man weasel on Mars. Do you hear me? Aye, came the response. I'm getting too old for this shit. Dwight held a pained expression on his face. I'm glad to hear it, and I'm honoured to hear it sort of serve you all. Regardless, I make a goddamn record of this police crime. Regardless of if you're a human being or a new man, the term our humans have agreed to refer to synthoids as from now on. And that, as they say, was that. Nestor Dormus set course for Earth. Dexter found that his own lab and was able to fix Melanie's epileptic condition with the stem cells. It turned out Scott was in fact a cloned new man himself, but he had not been awakened until after Balor's mutiny. If only every story had such a happy ending. 
Dexter died surrounded by his family with Melanie at his side in the year 2140 and had a statue put up in Manchester in his honour. A fate he would have smiled at, no doubt. Only the wise and old have tasted such darkness. That smooth dark love that burns the lips like wine. Prometheus inverted. The end.